Minister Cox, good morning to my cabinet colleagues, Minister Cox, Minister Dial Singh, to the CMO and to the viewing and listening public of Trinidad and Tobago and of course our members of the media. Good morning. This morning we published regulation number 13 under the public health coronavirus regulations as we call it and it's under the public health ordinance. There's just a few issues I'd like to draw to your attention and to let the public know how we intend to deal with this first phase one that both the Prime Minister and the Minister of Health have alluded to in speaking to the population. First of all, public transport remains the same. 50% is what we're allowing in, in the maxis, in the taxis, etc. All of these measures, of course, are decided by the government after close consultation and the advice of our medical public health experts. And every single measure is done to protect the population of Trinidad and Tobago. With respect to public gatherings, we still have kept it at five, so there to be no social gatherings in public places, apart from the essential places, of more than five. With essential places, and I'll get to the what we call itinerant food sales, which are what we know as roadside food sales. The gyro man, the hamburger man, the hot dogs, the selling of drinks from a cooler, doubles, all of these various things. Pies, I heard the <laughs> Minister of Health refer to. I'll get to what we, re what we are really asking for the assistance on these things is please, social distancing, physical distancing continues and we're asking that the vendors place your markers, the six feet apart and that people adhere to it. But I'll get to the regulations. No more than five persons allowed to socially gather in public places. We have also, whilst we've eased up the restrictions on exercising, and people can conduct themselves in outdoor exercising no more than five persons in any gathering. And we specifically said in the regulations, you cannot participate in any sport or team sport which involves more than five persons. That will be a breach of the regulations. We're asking people to adhere to this. Of course, we've kept the beaches or rivers, streams, ponds, springs, or other bodies of water closed during this phase. And we ask people to continue to adhere, it, uh, adhere with it. All I'm doing is highlighting the new measures. Everything else remains in place. Workers who feed and look after, look after and feed animals at farms, zoos and animal shelters, you are allowed to conduct that feeding and to go, go along your business. With respect to agriculture, I'd like to make this specific point. Agriculture, food production via agriculture is 100% unimpeded. In fact, last night we added a regulation that services and workers engaged in construction related to agricultural and food production, including land preparation and any activity related to agriculture and or food production is allowed. The message is there is absolutely nothing in the public health regulations that impedes anyone from conducting any business for land from land preparation, construction of the necessary infrastructure for agriculture, the planting, the receding, everything related to agriculture is permitted and we took the further steps of just making that even clearer in this latest set of regulations. To get to the specifics, hardwares as you know we've allowed to be open now every day from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. We've said now street vending of food and beverages, all retail food services, delivery and takeaway food services shall only be open for sales to the public until 8 p.m. every day. This is a measure where we've opened back up that industry and it includes all of all of the um, food items, itinerant, non-itinerant, and you're allowed to sell until 8. We're asking people, please close off at 8. This is being done for the specific public health and regulations and to allow us to be able to police it for want of a better phrase. Retail services, you could continue to be such as the markets, supermarkets, fruit stalls, vegetable stalls, bakeries, parlors for the provision of food, etc., can be open for CLC public until 6 p.m. This is a measure we've all become accustomed to. We've gone through a number of cycles with it. The pharmacies remain at 8 p.m. So we know how these regulations are intended to work and by and large businesses have been conforming with it. What I'd like to now point out though, we have made it an offense for any in restaurant dining and by restaurant it's not only the formal restaurants in, in all of our, our different outlets that sell food there is to be no in-house dining that is now a breach of that would be an offense under the regulations importantly 
we are not allowing on-site consumption of any product provided by a street vendor selling food or drink. This is a very important regulation that now gives our law enforcement the power to deal with persons who breach this regulation. So when you go to your, your food vendor, your street vendor, to, to collect your or purchase your food item, be it gyro, hamburgers, hot dogs, whatever it may be, please understand that you're not allowed to consume it on site. Take it, move on, go, go away, go to your homes and eat the food, etc. But we are not allowing persons to congregate on site to eat these various food items. And to do so will be a breach of the regulations and the police will be entitled to charge you for that. That is very important. Also, when you are going to your various food outlets, please, as you heard the Minister of Health say, wear your mask, cover your nose and your, your, your mouth. Also, personal hygiene is important. And the social and physical distancing. The Trinidad and Tobago Police Service were aware of these regulations. I've been in constant communication with the Commissioner of Police, and they are going to be stepping up their continued police efforts with respect to keeping us all safe. So that is the first thing that I wanted to deal with. So everything else remains the same. We've been bombarded with a number of questions. The tire shops, the mechanics, those are not permitted. The auto spare parts are not permitted. Nothing else has been permitted apart from this. This is based very carefully on the advice we receive from the public health experts. The management of preventing the spread of the COVID-19 has been going fairly well in Trinidad and Tobago. It's something you as individuals are responsible for. Please continue to work with us, work with everyone to make sure we keep everyone safe. The next issue I've come here this morning to deal with is our borders. As you all are aware, we closed our borders to nationals and non-nationals on the 23rd of March. That exercise, as difficult as it is, and it is not based on any individual whatsoever, it has been managed very, very carefully. The importation of the virus is what got us that 116. We stopped the further importation by closing our borders and we will continue to manage our borders very carefully. And that's the point I want to emphasize. Part of the management of our borders is as you would have seen, as we allow certain people in, certain groups in, after very careful consideration and discussions with our public health experts, they have been going into state quarantine. The reason for that is it allows us to ring fence and to manage the people that we allow back in. So the state quarantining is a very, very important measure for those that we allow back in. Of course, there are limited facilities for state quarantining. So as we go forward, this is how we are dealing with the management of our borders. We continue to receive hundreds of applications from persons or nationals out there. You've heard us say time and time again, there are over 330,000 persons with Trinidad and Tobago passports. I continue to get requests from Ireland, from Saudi Arabia, from India, from Germany, from Russia, from the United States, the United Kingdom, and other various CARICOM countries. As you heard me announce last week, right now we're dealing with those from Guyana and those from Venezuela, and we're looking at it. There's another important exception that we're going to deal with next, and I want to send this signal here today. <clears throat> our students who are in Barbados and in Jamaica, we are going to be putting things in place. I am dealing with the principals of the various institutions in Barbados, Cave Hill, and in Mona, Jamaica. This morning, I had a conversation with the principal at the University of the West Indies, St. Augustine campus. What we're going to be looking at is in the first week of June, and we've already spoken to Caribbean Airlines, we will be planning an operation for Caribbean Airlines to go to both Barbados and Jamaica to bring back our local students. But there are important con conditions that must be fulfilled. The students who wish to come back, and this will be coordinated by the principals of these various institutions in Barbados and Jamaica. It is not a personal reach out to minister and a personal reach out to anyone here in Trinidad. We're going to carefully coordinate it with the principals in Barbados and in Jamaica. Every student who wants to return via this very careful operation is going to be quarantined in Barbados and in Jamaica for 14 days. That is the first condition. You will be quarantined in Barbados and Jamaica for 14 days. We are then going to arrange with Caribbean Airlines once we ascertain the number 
to take students to f fly up. We're going, we've been in discussions with Barbados and we're going to conclude those discussions. We're going to speak to the, the Prime Minister of Barbados to make the offer that students in Barbados who want to return once the Barbados government welcomes it. <clears throat> we will take them to Barbados. They will then go to, we will then go to Jamaica, bring down the students from Jamaica if they, to Barbados and to Trinidad. But you must quarantine for 14 days there. You must also then, when you return to Trinidad, you will be put into state quarantine for another 14 days. It has been suggested, and I want to completely debunk that suggestion, that the government abandoned anyone. The government of Trinidad and Tobago has not abandoned any national, including our students, wherever you are in the world. What we've done is carefully managed, after getting the advice and consultation with our public health experts, the population here. And as you've been seeing, we are carefully managing those returning to Trinidad and Tobago. There are hundreds of cruise workers out there. Other CARICOM islands, I think I heard the number for Jamaica is in the region of 7,000. For Trinidad, we have over 300. So bombarding and attacking the Minister of National Security and saying that I am preventing, it is simply not so. I have, com I have always conducted myself in whatever ministerial portfolio without fear or favor malice or ill will. I don't see the individuals. We have a job to perform and the job is to protect the people in Trinidad and to be continue nationals to shelter in place where you are. So there will be more information provided as we go forward. I'm going to have continued discussions with the principals in UWE, the principals in Cave Hill and Mona during the course of today, who will be asked to coordinate with the students in these two jurisdictions. You are going to be asked to quarantine for 14 days in Barbados and Jamaica. We will make the arrangements with Caribbean Airlines and bring you back. And when you arrive here, there will be another 14 day quarantine period. The next conversation that I'd like to have is there seems to be a continued proliferation of misinformation and misleading commentary taking place with respect to the visit of the Venezuelan Executive Vice President, Ms. Delcy Rodriguez, on the 27th of March of this year. As you've heard the Prime Minister, the Honorable Prime Minister say, Trinidad and Tobago's position, as is CARICOM's position, is guided by the UN Charter. So at this stage, the UN Secretary General has advised from very early o'clock that the United Nations recognizes the Maduro government. We have no horse in the race. So in our continued recognition in accordance with our obligations to the United Nations, a request was made in the first week of March by the Executive Vice President, Ms. Delcy Rodriguez, to come to Trinidad to speak to the Prime Minister. Ms. Rodriguez was appointed, I believe, on the 26th or 27th of February as the lead coordinator for the COVID response in Venezuela. Everything that happens in Venezuela has an effect on Trinidad and Tobago. We're seven miles off of the coast. Ms. Rodriguez came. There was no question or no asking of, well, what are you coming to discuss with us? The Prime Minister returned to Trinidad and Tobago on the 10th of March. I had a conversation with him thereafter. There was a plan for Ms. Rodriguez to come in, I believe, on the 16th of March. She then contacted me on that weekend to say she had developed a bit of a flu. In those circumstances, I asked Ms. Rodriguez to delay her trip to make sure that I protected Trinidad and Tobago and for us to ensure it was not anything related to the COVID virus. Authorization was given at the ministerial level. When I give authorization, I do not drill down into the type of plane, who owns the plane, nor do I ask to say who is the manifest, especially when it's a, a foreign government making the request. And I will give you other examples. The United States, who we continue to have an extremely good relationship with and who at National Security I work with on a weekly basis, made a request just a couple weeks ago for two military planes to land in Trinidad, to leave Trinidad, to come back to Trinidad. I just gave the approval because it is the United States government asking. I do not know who came on those flights, but what the condition is, is that they couldn't disembark. They picked up personnel in Ghana, they picked up personnel in Trinidad, they left. I don't know what type of planes came in, who came in on the planes, etc. The same requests have been made by other governments who ask for repatriation of their citizens. 
The same request was made because we're running an energy sector that is the lifeblood of revenue for Trinidad and Tobago. So in working with the other upstream companies, the energy companies, as you all are aware, there was one weekend when five charter flights came in. I don't ask who is on the charter flight, is it a Gulfstream, is it a King Lear, what type of plane it is, who owns the plane, but that information is provided. The public service processes that information. So the same thing applied. There have been many visits by the Venezuelan government over the past few years, way before even the sanctions came into place. At no time have I ever asked what plane it is, which plane you're coming in on. This whole conversation, Trinidad and Tobago, began with certain voices, Trinidadian voices, first of all starting and focusing on the sale of fuel by Paria on its route to Aruba. That is how this conversation began. So those who were not in the know started a conversation. Did Trinidad and Tobago through Paria sell fuel to Aruba that ended up somewhere else? We have investigated this. And I'm happy to say that the contract was a very clear contract with that sale of fuel to Aruba, which has happened in the past because Paria supplies fuel throughout the region, including to Aruba. There is an important condition and clause that was in that contract. And that condition and clause in, by Paria in the sale of fuel to Aruba or for transmission to Aruba had an important clause that said that that fuel is not for any sanctioned country. It is not for Iran. It is not for South Korea. It's not for Venezuela. So that is how Paria protected Trinidad and Tobago in the sale of fuel. They're told that it is for Aruba. There was the insertion of a clause, a specific contractual condition that the fuel is not for a sanctioned country. So that debunks this whole conversation that Pari or the government of Trinidad and Tobago negotiated or entered into any sale of fuel. This story arose by certain people in Trinidad. Up to today in the newspapers, one of them suggesting that, well, I don't know if this happened, but if if this happened and there was a sale of a fuel in this manner, this is what it means. The answer is it did not happen. A very careful contract for a normal sale of fuel took place with a condition it is not to be provided to any sanctioned country. That is the first point. And as soon as that whole tower started to crumble, that whole conversation coming from certain quarters in Trinidad, in a manner meant to create this information, in a manner meant to try and put us under scrutiny by our very close ally, the United States. The next thing we had is an appearance of certain manifests to do with the plane. As I've stated very clearly, as the Minister of National Security, with a request made, I authorized the Executive Vice President of Venezuela to come for a meeting with the Honorable Prime Minister. Up to Friday, when I heard the, the leader of the opposition, I did not know what type of plane they came on, which is etc. I've also heard it suggested that it is not true that we did not know who this delegation was. Exactly how it unfolded, people of Trinidad and Tobago, is at that stage there was COVID, so we were very cautious. The persons who could come into the room to meet with the Prime Minister was limited. We only met two people, the we being the Prime Minister, Minister of Foreign Affairs, Minister Moses, and myself, that was the extent of the Trinidadian delegation. The extent of the Venezuelan delegation that we met with was the Executive Vice President, Ms. Rodriguez, and a Mr. Chavez. Mr. Chavez was not introduced to us as any Vice, pre any vice President or President of PDVSA. In fact, at the time, we've subsequently found out he was on a commission for the restructuring of PDVSA. It is owned, that meeting took place on the 27th of March. It is only on the 28th of April, a month and a day later, the same Mr. Chavez was made the president of PDVSA. So once again, you have people trying to mislead the population, but worse than that, not only mislead the population of Trinidad and Tobago, but attract attention from one of our closest allies, the United States, by saying that the prime minister and his delegation met with a president from PDVSA. That is completely untrue. The other people who were on the manifest, we did not meet. We did not even come into contact with them. We saw them, they were brought in, the diploma, and they went down a corridor into a housing bay. The status of the meeting was, we even had the Venezuelan contingent of two in PPP 
PPE gear because we were so concerned about COVID. The conversation was about COVID. The conversation was about the 16,523 people who are registered in Trinidad and Tobago who are Venezuelans, plus the more that may be here. So all of these suggestions, all of this creation of disinformation, misrepresentations, which they can only answer as to why they are doing it, there is simply no truth to it. We did not meet anyone else from the delegation apart from Ms. Rodriguez and Mr. Chavez. Mr. Chavez was not the president of PDVSA at the time we met with him. We did not know the type of plane. We did not know the rest of the delegation. And at our level, meaning the cabinet ministers accompanying their prime minister, that is not an unusual occurrence. I have accompanied the prime minister and Minister Moses into the US Congress within recent times, when we've gone into meetings with US senators, with US House of Representative leaders at the highest level. And you see sitting behind them a number of support staff. At no point in time are we ever told who those support staff are. So this whole creation of this whole smoke screen, I completely debunk here today. I completely say there is no mischief on the part of the government of Trinidad and Tobago. We continue to work in full transparency. And as, as I was reminded by the Prime Minister, immediately as the meeting finished, and it was not a long meeting, and Ms. Rodriguez and her delegation left, we did not even do our traditional greetings because of the, of the distancing, because of COVID. Immediately as they were leaving the diplomatic center to return to Venezuela, the Prime Minister's office issued a release in full transparency that the meeting had taken place and what the meeting was about. So I remind the population, the conversation about the sale of fuel by Paria is covered. The sale of fuel by Paria co contained a condition that it is not to go to any sanctioned country. We had nothing to do with that. Then this whole idea of a smoke screen and who's playing and who was there, we met with two persons. It was not the president of PDVSA. That was a courtesy call with, a, with our closest neighbor to discuss what was going on with COVID. We do not know who the other members of the delegation were, and we never interacted with them. There were security personnel there. I saw Ms. Rodriguez's personal secretary and assistant, but that was it. The only two people we met with in that meeting were Ms. Rodriguez and Mr. Chavez, who was not the president of PDVSA. So for the leader of the opposition and others to now say we met with the president of PDVSA, he only became the president of PDVSA on the 28th of April, a month and a day after the meeting with us, the Trinidadian delegation. So I hope that these facts, which are irrefutable, will now put to bed for at least the right thinking and the civic-minded citizens of Trinidad and Tobago. I'd just like to end by saying, the United States, despite all you may be trying to do, those in Trinidad and create this mischief, continues to be our closest ally. I continue to be in constant, constant conversation with our friends in the United States. We had one of the largest drug busts two weeks ago. It went under the radar because of COVID. $663 million worth of illegal narcotics. And that was a transaction conducted by our Coast Guard our special units, our intelligence forces, and our U.S. allies. We continue to plan training with the United States Army. We continue to work very carefully with other agencies who form part of law enforcement and intelligence in the United States. I had a personal conversation with Ambassador Mondello last week at his request. We continue to have that very clear, transparent, candor, conversation and communication to our allies in the United States. And this government intends to keep that going, despite those who are attempting to create mischief and misinform you, the public of Trinidad and Tobago. Minister Cox, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Minister.